Hello and welcome to Boost Your Employability, a day in the life of KPMG's Head of Marketing. I'm delighted to be chatting with Deborah Homewood in this episode, which is part of the CIM Marketing Club series. Uh, I'm Johnny Crawley. I'm one of the partnership managers at CIM. Um, so Marketing Club, what is it? So um, Marketing Club provides content that's designed to support your learning um, and actively engage with your professional development and basically keeping you up to date with latest trends, innovations, concepts in the marketing industry. So this session is um, is going to be a little bit more of an open session. So I don't know whether you've checked into any of these sessions before, but if you've checked into a marketing club webinar before, this is going to be slightly different in format. We're going to, hoping to make it a little bit more interactive and, and loose around uh, the questions and things like that. Obviously, I'm reading at the moment. I don't want to make I want to make sure I'm not getting any facts uh, incorrect. Um, this session is um, is going to be open to to questions as ever. But rather than doing that at the end, we're going to welcome questions throughout. So if you've got any questions, feel free to drop them into the chat. Simply hover um, click on the um, question mark icon on your screen and um, you can drop your questions into there and we'll do our best to to get through those today and um, also the session is going to be recorded and you can find that later on the cim marketing club webpage and also we're putting it on cim youtube channel in about a week's time in case you want to watch that again on demand if you want to share any thoughts about the webinars on on any social please use the hashtag cim events. Right, so before I introduce Deborah, I just want to set the scene a little bit because Deborah and I have chatted a couple of times about what we want to achieve from this session and there's a lot we can cover. Essentially, we came to the conclusion that it's important to be realistic about a career, particularly in marketing, but also it may extend into a career in a profession. So it may be that you feel you uh, have got good enough skills and you know enough now to get a decent job and that's great. We're going to talk to you about what will help you be successful and happy in your career as well, which is becoming increasingly more important um, as people look to balance a good working career with a happy and healthy lifestyle away from their job. So I'm going to introduce Deborah now. Um, I'd like to say uh, hello, Deborah. Uh, thank you. Welcome. And uh, really excited to be chatting with you today. How are you? I'm great. Thank you very much, Johnny, and thank you for having me on this session. Um, I'm hoping to inspire some uh, interesting questions. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, it's really important that we do these sorts of things, and it's really important that CIM supports this, especially from a health and wellbeing point of view, because I know I'm for those that don't realise, quite old. Um, at the start of my career, this sort of thing didn't really um, happen. A lot and so I think the fact that we're moving into that space now is really really important for people coming through into the into the profession. Brilliant well glad to have you I don't think you're old um, I'd say you're experienced <laughs> and that's exactly why we've got you here so we can uh, we can fire away with some stuff so I, I've got a bunch of questions initially just to sort of kick, sure. kick them off but again just to reiterate please get your questions in and um, because I, I can see that some things are starting to come in already um, so I will check those out in a sec. Just to get things moving, um, currently you're working as head of marketing uh, national markets for KPMG UK. So for those of you that aren't aware, KPMG is the fourth largest accountancy firm in the world and employs nearly 230,000 people globally. Um, and it's also turned over 23.6 billion uh, last year. That's 23.6 billion, so huge organisation. Tell me what it's like to work for an organisation such as KPMG. What's a typical day like? Oh, crikey. Oh, there, we could talk for hours just on that question alone. Um, there is no typical day, OK? And that is probably part of the joy, if I'm going to be honest. Um, the national markets piece of KPMG is what we call mid-market. So it ranges anything from sort of your startups and scale-ups right the way up to your FTSE 250. So for us, our client portfolio is pretty vast. So I, and of course I would say this, our typical day is that we are talking to such a diverse portfolio of clients um, from, like I say, your entrepreneurs sat in the garage that are going to be the next big thing, the next gym shark, right the way up to, you know, um, the, the head of um, some of our biggest banks 
um, because we want to get their insights into helping um, the future funding mechanisms coming through. So there is no typical day. Um, and I think that as anybody that wants to sort of evolve their career in marketing, that's actually quite a joyful thing. Um, what I would say is there's a typical week. And what I do tend to do is start and end the week on a kind of on a vibe. The first bit of the week is that we we talk about um, me and my team, uh, what's inspired over the weekend? What do we want to bring into our lives this week that we can talk about from a business perspective? And that can be something as one of our one of our content writers talked about mac and cheese, for instance. Well, how do you bring that into a business context? Well, then you talk about logistics and production and the value, you know, the cost of living going up and that sort of stuff. But then we talk about what's on the rack for the rest of the week. And then at the end of the week, we sort of celebrate our successes because, again, Coming back to that health and well-being point, it's really important when you're working in marketing to understand how far you've come in any given week. Because to be frank, you're like a whirly gig half the time. You're project managing, you're juggling, you're pacifying, you're stakeholder managing, you're coming up with creative ideas, you're doing it all. And sometimes you think, oh, my God, I've achieved nothing. But actually just resetting at the end of the week and going, do you know what? We've had a blooming good week this week because we've done this, 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 and this. It just galvanizes us. So typical day, never. Typical week, start and end with a good thing. Brilliant. I, I think that well-being thing is, is really important, particularly as people are working uh, a lot longer these days. Um, obviously, we see the trend of people moving from, from industry and sector and probably even profession as well. Um, so, I, I mean... I'm like no, no different to anybody else, you know, obviously I have my peaks and troughs in terms of how I feel in, in certain days. So, yeah, I really like the idea of um, having sort of almost a checkbox exercise to, to assess, you know, what you've done, because, you know, some of those campaigns can, can take a long time, can't they? Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong, marketing can be the most vibrant, fulfilling, exciting, joyous thing in your life. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I live and breathe this. I can't think of anywhere else I'd rather be. But it can be ultimately so frustrating as well. I mean, when you when you talk about KPMG, yes, you're right to go for those big stats. Um, but because of that, we've got a very stable brand that has to be adhered to that has to um we can't just run off and do all these really creative campaigns that we'd like to do like disruptor brands can and things like that so there's a, there's a lot of process that comes into um to working for one of the big four um very much like it would be for working for a coca-cola or a british airways or something like that with a younger company a more um, a smaller outfit you've probably got a little bit more flexibility so balancing that I think is really important as well having that uh, opportunity to balance the frustrations of the week and the the moments of pure pleasure is really important um, and 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 taking time out to to recognize that as well okay brilliant so clearly you know there's lots of um, kind of behaviors and, and knowledges that you can okay. kind of around that and you've talked a little bit about um, what it's like to work for a large organisation, but marketing's everywhere and it impacts all sectors and all industries. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about what it was like before you worked for a large organisation and if the types of skills, behaviours and knowledges you had to apply to that specific time of your life was different? Um oh crikey yes and no okay if you're doing a campaign the campaign basics stay the same right you you know you start with an idea you look at what you're trying to achieve you go to the business plan the objective and you run it right the way through to what your roi is there's a there's a standard formula how you interact with the sector or the industry or indeed the stakeholders you're managing differs wildly of course it does so would i say the behaviors are the same yes they are definitely the same um and the, and the technical skills you know you need are probably the same. However, you're going to need it in a different balance depending on the sector or industry you're in. For instance, you know, when I worked in the charity sector, you think that 
charity it's light and fluffy and and you know are they really doing doing good actually leveraging stakeholders leveraging funding leveraging all the the stuff that keeps the good purpose stuff driving through is really hard man it's not as easy as people think whereas when you're working for a, a KPMG or a big corporate, your budgets are very different. So you're 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 given a little bit more flexibility on that side. So every skill that you have, you deploy on every single piece of campaign or marketing or et cetera, et cetera. But it's just in different parameters that you would employ them. But I go back to when we had the discussions the other week. You know, everybody's a marketeer, everybody's a salesperson, and those behaviors you need to sort of really, um, really play through your whole organization. And part of our job as marketeers is to really train people to understand that they are brand champions, they are salespeople, they're marketeers. It doesn't just stop with the person that's got the title marketing, because if it did, we'd never, we'd never achieve anything. So, you know, marketing, you need you need an absolute toolkit of skills that go way, way beyond the what you would say, the teaching skill set. And you develop those over time. Um, so I know that you said at the, at the start, people might be deciding to transfer careers and things like that. There's a lot of transferable skills that come into marketing. Yes, you, you need the technical stuff. Of course you do. But you can learn that. What you you really do need is that sort of passion, that integrity, um, resilience. These are all you can get these from any kind of job role, really. You just need an authenticity that I think really sings through. And you you know, your CIM marketing stuff is really, really important because you should never ever stop learning as individuals we should never stop learning as humans we should never stop learning but more so in marketing because like i say when my experience rather than age um you know i i've kind of i've seen it i've done it I, you know all that sort of stuff but i never stop learning because there's always something new and that is really important to to think about as somebody coming into the industry or indeed somebody a midpoint or someone looking to be a leader you need to keep learning to make sure that you keep current and that way we can be the best marketeers that we can be brilliant so, so you talked to me i'm glad you mentioned the authenticity bit and the passion because i think you said something like uh, passion authenticity and diversity equals happiness or something and i i, I loved that because that was um kind of I suppose moves into the personal life as well, but also allows you to bring yourself to an organization. So how important is that for you personally, but also for you surrounding yourself with people within your team or, or, or other teams? Yeah, it's really it's really important. And I don't think any of us really get that right. There's always going to be a balance. I mean, for me, um, I, 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 I go at the extremes of passion. I'm like, you know, come on, we've all got to get excitable and oh, let's do all this stuff. But I need to have that balance. So when you consider creating a team or you consider an organization, you've got to have the sort of um, the yin and yang. And I think more and more as people understand sort of neurodiversity and um, a th a more ways that the brain sort of allows us to compartmentalize and come up with different skills and, and be good at certain things. And we start to look at job carving as a realistic way of creating roles for people. I think that that becomes more and more important. Because for me, yes, you've got to have passion. You've got to have that authentic voice and not be afraid to stand up and challenge and and be um, and, and and be real to yourself. You've got to bring your whole self every single day because otherwise, you're only getting half half a person. And what what does that really help me as a as a manager or kpmg as a as a, a firm if we're only getting half a person yeah we can obviously when when you know everything's within reason but i really love the fact that you can bring 
different people together and they spark different discussions and they and thoughts go off in tangential ways and that little bit of a spark can actually create something that's magical and that new campaign can be just wow and and you don't get that from just being an individual you get that as being part of a network as part of a team and accepting that everybody's got a part to play in that absolutely and and i suppose uh, what you're touching on there is innovation comes from ideas and bringing people from different backgrounds whether that be um social backgrounds uh, ethnicity age groups and that sort of thing um yeah. and obviously be working across cross-functional teams which which marketers typically do whether they're working for an agency for themselves or or for a large organization um that's needed so um just kind of some of the questions that are coming in from from our listeners they're asking kind of specifics about um, skills and traits and things like that. So when we, you and I talked before, it's so vast, it's very difficult to sort of yeah. say what the top two, three or four are. But actually, I think what we're touching on here is what's important to you and having those kind of values as well in terms of the types of work that you want to undertake an organisation. So. Has that, has that impacted on your career and, you know, some of the choices you've made in terms of who you've worked with or for? Um, yes, because I'm I'm quite a purpose driven individual. I and no disrespect to anybody that's working out there at the moment, but I I'd, I'd struggle to work for, say, a tobacco industry or something like that because it doesn't sit well with my values. OK, um, that's not to say that they haven't got great CSR and they're trying to do good things and they've got money back into the economy. And, I, I you know, I hear the economic um, arguments, especially as you, you know, you, you get a little bit longer in the tooth. But for me, I've always directed my career towards things that I've really had a passion about. So we go back to KPMG, you might say, well, crikey, you know, this is a global accountant. You gave the figures that, you know, how are you doing good there? But I do good every day because I'm speaking to clients who want to grow their business. They want to um, have a purpose of their own. They want to um, bring economic stability to their community. They are the backbone of the UK economy. So by actually doing my bit, albeit in a massively huge global network, I am actually driving purpose there. I'm giving value. And I think that if I can go to bed each night and go, do you know what? I did a good thing today, then that for me is 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 what you know we're all sort of here for really um but going back to one of those those sort of aspects values and behaviors are something that i think are inherent okay and if i'm looking to hire a team around me i think i touch on those things about you know their passion their resilience their work ethic those sorts of things um the actual nuts and bolts i can teach I can absolutely teach that because I talked to a little bit before about transferable skills. So there's a little bit around that as well, about thinking about what your core values are and what is important to you. Um, and that then directs you into a sector, an industry, a firm that really aligns with yourself. And that then brings your true self to the workplace. Okay, thank you. And we can get a few questions around kind of specifically, you know, what can I do as a, as a, as a graduate or as a student now to to uh, make myself a Now, um, research that both CIM has done and something that you and I have talked about is that a lot of people that are graduating from university have some great skills and, and enthusiasm, but they're not work ready. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, OK. Um, and this probably is a little bit of painful hearing for some individuals, but yeah. OK, there's certain, th there's certain things you can do. Um, but I think the starting point of what you shouldn't do, really, you shouldn't go into the workplace thinking that you're going to become a millionaire overnight. You shouldn't go into the workplace thinking that you are deserving of a career in this area or that you're owed a job. And I know that sounds really crappy, but that's the fact of life. 
I mean, I, one of my previous roles was working in the um, apprenticeship sector for um, Greater Manchester uh, Combine Authority. And we were seeing graduates there that were doing bar jobs because they'd literally gone through their degree thinking, OK, I'm just going to walk into a job. That's not the case anymore. Life is too competitive. You have to have these added on little bits that make you and your CV stand out. Now, it's a little bit akin to the whole American model where the the kids that go through schooling there are, you know, are trained to put the bells and whistles on so that they've got those transferable skills. But just because you've worked in a bar or you've worked in Topshop or you've worked in M&S or wherever you've worked, Think about what that means and think about how you can lay that over your career. Because like I said, just in that last bit, work ethic is absolutely crucial. If I've got somebody that comes in and goes, right, listen, I'm just hungry for this. I, I know I haven't got that much experience, but this is what I did and this is how I did it. And this, I think, is how it would transfer over. I go, oh, they've got something about them. If I've got somebody that comes in and goes, you know what, I've got a degree in marketing. I know what I'm doing. Come on, give me a job. I think. Mm, sorry mate I'm not really that inclined so it's thinking about you and your brand because that's really important but what can you do well first of all you can keep up to date um but network absolutely that whole adage of it's not what you know it's who you know is really really important and if you just look at LinkedIn for instance look at the the wealth of information and people out there that are willing to help and support the next generation coming through they're all out there we're all out there if you reach out to me as a graduate and go do you know what could I spend 10 minutes with you once a month just picking your brains on something I find it very hard to believe that people that have got to my level would say no because We've all been there. We've all wanted that support. We've all needed that encouragement. And now it's so blooming competitive, right? It's 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 so much harder for you guys. So you have to have that leg up. So use those kind of opportunities because it's the only way that you'll get through the door. Every I mean, we see thousands of CVs. What makes yours special? And it's not about putting a, a picture on it of you abseiling. I don't I don't need to know that. What I need to know is what have you done? to date that I can then see fitting into my team and growing my team and being part of that. Okay, brilliant. And um, kind of leading on to, from the network building bit that you mentioned, um, I have a couple of questions that are fairly similar. Um, and somebody's asking about, um, have you ever had imposter syndrome? Mm -hmm. uh, asking about kind of, you know, not having the confidence and, and, and um, you know, to do that kind of thing. Has oh. that ever did you? Yes. And how did you overcome it? Oh my God! Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> Everybody has imposter syndrome. Listen, I get it every single day. Okay, and there's that little bit of an um, uh, one of the one of my team that works for me. Uh, we say it all the time, fake it till you make it, right? So long as you've got the skills, you know your stuff. You can get up there and you can do it. Yes, you're going to have wobbles. Of course, you're going to have wobbles because you're human. But I was speaking to an ex-co member. That's our board. And he said every single day, I think, the hell am I doing here? Why am I giving advice to people? And this is like somebody that I totally respect and is making massive decisions for a global company. Everybody has imposter syndrome. It's really about how you manage it. And if you can stand up and go, do you know what? I am doing my best. I have researched this. I know my stuff. And then there's a little bit of gamesmanship in there. Then you will win. You will just win. And you, it's natural, but use it to your advantage. Be vulnerable. Do you know what? Somebody standing up there and going, oh, I know it all. Don't be silly. I, I never get that. I never get that. But somebody turning around and going, ooh, I feel a little bit worried at the moment. That's authentic. That's real because we all get that. So be your real self because people love that. Absolutely. So push yourself out of your comfort zone. And, you know, if you if you are studying in your, your university or, you know, perhaps you're not, um, give yourself the opportunity to, to, to do those things. You know, the only way you're going to overcome some of those fears, as you may call yeah. them, um, is, is to practice those and um, you'll get better, genuinely. 
And um, it's uni. You've got stuff at uni, haven't you? Like, you know, your debate societies and stuff like that, or um, going on to student councils or something like that. Those all look great on your CV. But also, they do what you're saying. They push you out of your comfort zone, don't they? Even if you do some volunteering, it pushes you out of your comfort zone. It's all these little added things that help you, whether you, you know, transferable skills again I worked in the pub I did I did um I did tilling up but I also had to um present the latest gin range to the clients who only ever wanted Gordon's but we had to upsell Hendrix da, da, da. this is how I did it when you, you you've you presented there so use that as a present it's a presenting issue and again come back to these free opportunities like CIM, like LinkedIn Learning, like Google Garage, all these things where there's loads of tricks and tips that you can take that will help you out from that. Brilliant. I love that. Using gin as an analogy, something I can relate to. <laughs> so um, what, would you, what would you say that in terms of your experience, so you, you've been a marketer for about 20 years now, what experience have you kind of used from day one that's helped you get to, to where you are? And I realise that's quite a broad, a broad question. Okay, what, what experience? Okay, oh God. Um, well, first of all, I started off as um, a, well, a precocious little brat, I suppose. So I've always been um, quite stubborn. Um, so that's a sort of behaviour trait that has come with me throughout my throughout my career but I think um, my my background in horse riding was um, a massive sort of influence in how I take on disappointment competition and um, I became more resilient um, it, it's hard it's hard to um, to get to a level of competition where you are you know challenging yourself and you're going up against people that are older and more experienced better than you but it makes you rally into becoming better and wanting to do more and it hurts it hurt it, you know every day you're coming back going oh i didn't do it and i'm really frustrated and i just want to give up but you don't because that's part of growing up and i think that those sorts of skills really helped me at the beginning of my career because I didn't just fall into marketing. I started off in journalism and I loved writing. Um, and then I went into PR and still loved writing, but then kind of started to make that switch into marketing because it offered more opportunity, offered more um, joy, it offered more diversity. And I still take those basics of, stubbornness resilience that drive all the way through every single role that I've taken because again you can you can teach people to do the technical stuff you can't teach those fundamentals um but I think probably my core skill skill is my writing I love writing I absolutely do and we've got a we've got a really lovely content team um in our current project and they're brilliant and i feel envious of them every single day because they're coming up with fabulous ways of using content and words and and it's just it's magical and um yeah i feel a bit jealous of that and that's the only thing about going up in your career you don't get to do some of the really lovely joyful things anymore that you really would like to yeah. well um Clearly, you've enjoyed marketing because you've been there for, for for twenty years. So there must be there must be some really sort of valuable things that, that you get out yeah. of that. And and you've obviously been very successful in what in what you do. And this is a bit of a maybe a tough one for you to to, to answer. Um, it's, it's a little bit tougher for me to ask as well. But is there anything that you wish you were better at? And if so, what is that? Oh God, yeah, I wish I was better. At, um, at processes, 
definitely. I'm 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 great at creative. I'm great at blue sky thinking, but processes, data, reporting, all that sort of stuff that is really really important bores me silly. Now I'll do it because we all have to do things in a job. Going back to that whole when you graduate, you think everything's sunshine and roses. It isn't. We all have to do things that we hate. Um, but yeah, I really do wish that I had a bit more of a joy in that. Um, because the, the whole the whole bits of that I find so dull. I really do. And I really wish I didn't because that's the science behind marketing. That is how you convince what I call the bean counters, the people who give you your budget, you know, your boards, that this really matters. It affects the bottom line, that marketing is an utterly crucial part of the mix when making any business decision. Um, now I can talk to it, of course I can, um, but actually getting that data, oof, yeah, I just, I do wish I was better at that. That, that proves that, you know, you can be successful in marketing and um, you, you don't have an interest in all of it, or perhaps um, it doesn't necessarily play to your strengths, and, and that kind of touches on the fact that nobody's perfect. Absolutely, and it goes back to that point about job carving. I know that I have a weakness in that area. So as a hiring manager, I have to fill that gap. Yeah. You know, and, and that's you know, that's a given. And surrounding yourself with people that make you look good is part of being a manager, right? But when we go back to this whole idea of neurodiversity and the way that I think that careers are gonna go, um, not you know not too far in the future here when we talk about job carving we're looking at what skills do we need and what type of persona what kind of neurodiverse individual will fit those skills and that gap and we create a role for that person as opposed to creating a role and a person trying to fill it because you will always get people like me who are generalists for want of a better phraseology but that don't don't like doing those bits are not very good at it so why persevere with that when there are individuals that absolutely love that side of it and actually bring together a bigger network of individuals into a team that make it far better far more robust and far more successful and, and, and understanding who you are as a person would help you make some of those decisions and come to some of those realizations and um, yeah. you and I have probably done countless um, exercises when you start with a new organization or maybe in your own time where you look at what type of person you are and you know in the old days we used to call it introvert extrovert but it's more than that isn't it and it's playing to some other strengths yeah and you might not know what that is I mean no crikey it's like the old adage what you're going to be when you grow up I still don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up <laughs> you never do you're constantly learning but I think as you if you're really honest with yourself and you go back to that whole basics of, of, of doing a campaign, what's a SWOT analysis? You know, what's the strength, what's the weakness, the opportunity, the threat sort of thing. And if you put you as the what you're trying to get your SWOT analysis and you say, well, I love that. Ooh, I'm going to be honest, I really hate that and stuff like that. You can actually work out what kind of role you want to be playing. And that's really important because you might see something that's really interesting on paper or that's got a big shiny salary attached to it or something like that but don't always go for that go for the thing that's going to bring you joy you do this for so many hours in your life you're you, you know you work at this you get a career in it there will always be something else around the corner don't always just jump at something because you think you should do it because you really want to because you're not being true to yourself if you don't. And moreover, you're probably not going to get any joy from that role at all because you're not you're, you're trying to put a square peg in a round hole, whereas the round pegs out there are still wanting that job. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's personal. Analogy. Analogy. If you're going to fake it till you make it, there's no point in faking it and faking it until yes. you make it. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, somebody's asking about uh, working in a, in a B2B environment. Um, so have you seen any changes in marketing in the last few years around B2B marketing and, and um, what advice would you give to somebody working in B2B marketing? Okay, well, I'd say stop thinking about B2B to start um, because ultimately 
as we move through that whole cycle, we're actually seeing more B to C or indeed B to I um, sort of techniques coming into play. Because yes, you are a business trying to attract a, another business, but are you trying to attract a business or are you trying to attract a buyer within that business? So actually turning that psychology on its head and appeal to the buyer as opposed to the business makes you more successful. So stop thinking in terms of B to B, B to C, etc., and think of B to I or B to me, because I think it really switches the ideas and your your campaign will become a very different beast, really. And you know what? People buy off people, they don't buy off businesses. They don't, you know, they, they yes, they like the brand. They like the service that they offer, but ultimately it's we're, we're humans. We connect together as individuals. Um, so there's very few companies that are pure, pure B2B these days. OK, thank you. Um, somebody saying they absolutely love your vibe. So um, <laughs> well, well done so far. <laughs> and they want to know what your favourite campaign has been and, and why. Oh gosh, um, goodness me, my favourite campaign. What, that I've ever worked on? Good Lord. Well, let's, let's just say a, one, of, one of your favourites. Um, I think because I was very young and I was very starstruck and also don't kill me, all these people that like, oh, I like your vibe, well, you yeah, probably might, might hate me now. I'm a Manchester City fan. Um, way before they got the money, please don't judge me. Um, and I worked on um, a lot of their campaign around um, getting their training ground up with community facilities. So I did a lot of the community engagement around there with the club, with the community that we were um, looking to on board with a lot of individuals. We used art, we used poetry, we used photography, we used sport, we used all these different levers to bring everybody together to have a voice. And I think that was one of my favourite campaigns because I was a little bit starstruck and um, it was really successful. So, and that goes back to purpose as well because we were doing things the right way for the right reasons so that was really good um i do wish that i'd worked on some more disruptor type brands sort of like can you imagine being around at the start of innocent drinks and things like that i mean they must have had a ball right um i do wish that i'd, I'd been around that sort of vibe um but do you know what like i say I, experience rather than age i've worked on an awful lot of stuff and i'm very very privileged to have done that but i think that's the joy of marketing you get to do that whether you're doing it in a small scale or a big scale marketing can influence everything really and so long as you believe that in your soul that there is a place for marketing in every single business decision you can wheedle your way in there and you can make your presence felt on any type of campaign um whether like i say it's a community engagement one or it's a big out of office uh, out of home sorry big shiny dancey campaign anything you can want to get involved in you can do as a marketer because essentially you're a project manager aren't you, you you've got all these different skills and techniques up your sleeves that you can apply to anything you're a budgeteer you're a manager you're a stakeholder manager you are creative you can write you can do digital you can social post you can do all these wonderful things so don't limit yourself just push your way in there good answer thank you um so rolling back a little bit um probably about 20 years what was your first job in, in, in marketing? And um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you got into that? Because you had a bit of a career change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started, I started in journalism and then went into PR. I suppose my first real marketing role was with a very small agency in Manchester. And um, I was an account manager uh, for Gleason Homes. And, um, I was very young and very enthusiastic and I did everything from the brochure creation to the print to the advertising, which, you know, you guys won't know any of this 
the horror that you had to create bromides and you had to send them to the paper and they could get corrupted because they were like little pieces of film and stuff like that this is very old and um, but part of that was doing the show homes as well and we had to do show home openings and we had to design all the the invitations and all the the signs you know you see at the side of the roads and all that sort of stuff and then you have to put on a big event to welcome people um you know whether that be with little mimosas or little cupcakes and things like that and um it, it that was my first taste of marketing really doing the whole thing and it was just brilliant because yeah you were in a complete and utter frenzy because you had targets to get so many people through the door and all that sort of stuff and it was how do you do it but getting that creative spark about how do we generate that how do we get the footfall how do we do this how do we do that to being there on the day and you know being part of the events team handing stuff out to, to actually having to go in fancy dress because the the big bloody stuff <laughs> mouse that we asked to attend didn't didn't arrive and so then all of a sudden it's like well who's going to dress up as the mouse you know you kind of go oh, <laughs> you know everybody has to muck in right that's that's the joy of marketing as well that inevitably something will go wrong but you you, you have contingencies but that was my first taste and i just thought you know what this is magnificent you can be you can you can have that absolute joy of not one single day being the same but having still that that absolute creative um influence over over your day and that just it was a it was like mind blown absolute mind blown um and yeah and i never stayed away from it brilliant brilliant so was it the costume or was it the was it the job that <laughs> I love, I love the way how that, that's so, so hands-on, you know, and probably so far removed from from what people starting out in marketing is is, is today. But it just, it just <laughs> works and shows how it how it's yeah. transitioned. Yeah, but I also think that that you know you say that it's it's transition from how it is today, but there's no such thing as a new idea, and and you know that sort of experiential stuff that we were doing back in the day that will come back around because as we start to keep that digital movement going forward yes there's always going to be a place for digital now but I think that that sort of uh, that personal touch the experiential stuff will start to come back again it's a bit like print isn't it print died but print will come back as well uh, you know it, it always does it's secular so that's why I always think that keeping yourself fresh and keeping learning. Yes, you might be a digital marketeer now, but make sure that you understand the basics of traditional marketing as well. Make sure that you understand the basics of event management. Make sure you understand the basics of how media work, et cetera, because you don't know when you're gonna need that because things do come back full circle. And there's also the other thing that when you are in a small organization, you say that things have moved on. You know, we were in a, um, a several hundred million pound organization but we still stuff and duff envelopes because there's no one else to do it we're you know organizations are lean now aren't they you you don't have that um opportunity to have a post room and a this and a that and the other and the other you know if a lot of this sort of stuff falls down to marketing but i strongly believe that if there's a job to be done then every single person on the team should be able to do it and that that's me myself included i.e why i will dress up as a a mouse and <laughs> other things. Fair enough. Um, somebody's asking about um, types of qualifications that you might need, and, uh, and specifically, they've mentioned masters and uh, an MBA. Uh, so, if mm -hmm. you're recruiting somebody, um, let's say a graduate, mm -hmm. would you look for that, and, and how favourable is that? Because obviously, it's very costly and time-consuming for people to, to to do these things. Yeah, well, there's two things there, isn't there? Um, you go to a good employer, they're going to put you through it if you really want to. So why take that cost on yourself, which you probably should go, shh, don't tell anyone I said that. However, um, for me, it's it's not that important, if I'm going to be honest. If you've been a career academic, it's probably a bit of a turn off for me. If you've done it whilst you've been working, oh, my God, hats off to you, because that is hard, man to be able to balance that kind of work life education balance. I, I yeah, seriously, hats off to you. Um, a lot of places say, oh, we need a degree and things like that. And indeed our place does. But if I got a CV through, 
from somebody that actually sh can show that they've worked on some amazing campaigns, they've, they've got the smarts, they've delivered against ROI, etc. I'd be more inclined to see them than somebody that's got a degree that hasn't got that experience. So it very much depends, again, on your personal brand and how you present yourself. MBAs are really interesting uh, because I think we're seeing now a, a distinct shift in the way that marketing is viewed by um, by C-suites now. I think we are now part of the C-suite conversation, which is is about blooming time, right? Um, explain what C-suite is to some. Oh, people. sorry. So C-suite is your your kind of uh, chief exec, your chief operating officer, your chief financial officer. So your chief marketing officer now forms part of that what we call C-suite. So it's your decision makers at the top of the tree. Traditionally, that's not always been the case, especially with smaller organisations. Um, and if they did have a voice at that table, it was minimised a little by some louder voices. But I think now that marketing is being seen as very influential in that bottom line discussion. So if you think about something like cyber, for instance, everybody knows that we've got to protect our organisations against cybercrime. But your CTO, your chief technology officer might say, oh, well, we need to put in a 14 stage authentication process in order to safeguard this, that and the other. Whereas your CMO, your chief marketing officer would say, whoa, just one second there. If you do that, you're going to have no organization to safeguard because your customers will go where there is a better customer experience. So I think that marketing is now being seen as an advisory and an influencer at that top table, which is really, um, which is really interesting and really important. So getting back to the MBA, do I think that that's important? Yes, because if you can have an, a, a traditional MBA looks at all of that buying power, looks at all those seats at the table. Do I think that I would only recruit someone with an MBA? Absolutely not. No. Um, it's more about you, your experience, and it's about that connectivity, that personality, that um, that vibe I get from you. And um, I I make sure that I always personally interview every single member of my team. Um, whether it's at last stage, first stage, whatever, because I need to make sure that they fit with the team, that the personality mix, as well as the skills mix, is absolutely spot on. And that's more important to me as a hiring manager. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, someone's asking uh, quite a specific question that's um, clearly quite personal to them, but everybody will come across this in, in, in their lives probably. And they're asking about how they go about getting a promotion. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, Wow, yeah. Do you know what? It's, uh, sometimes it's easier just to ask the males this question because females are not very good at this. Uh, we're getting better, I've got to say, but um, it's it's a really tricky one. I think it's part of um, knowing your worth for a start. Um, I would also um, do some practice things because as I say as a female you're not very good sometimes at selling yourself and it might be that you're, you're male and you're not very good at selling yourself either let's not be gender bias on this but what really helps is when I go back to that initial start of our journey together today and I said about the, the the start of the week and the end of the week document your wins document your successes whether it's on a spreadsheet it's just in a notebook whatever because if you start to collect those things, when you start doing your reviews, and I mean your appraisals or whatever your your company or your, your future company will call them, you can start to use that as evidence as to where you've made a difference. And when you start to see where you've made that evidence base, you kind of go, do you know what? I do deserve a promotion. I do deserve a pay rise. And this is what I want. Use things like Glassdoor. Use things like um, job ads start to benchmark where your skills and where your um, your salary base should be and things like that. And just keep an eye on those things because it's, it's, it's really important. Again, come back to that learning. Always get new little skills throughout the year so that you can say, OK, this time last year I was this. But this year I've got um, I've done Adobe Photoshop training. I've done, um, you know, um, Digital Marketing 101, I've done this, I've done that. So you've got fresh skills to bring to the table to show that your worth has gone up. Um, 
look at what the competition are doing what you know what where where are they benchmarking themselves and go in with an open conversation but don't go in with emotion that's the worst thing you can do just go in with the facts and say this is what i believe and if you get pushback you say okay back on to you what do i need to do what three things do i need to do to get me to that level within six months within a year so that you have got a journey to it to to go towards if that doesn't make sense to you or you find that an appetizing or you you don't agree then you've got you've got options haven't you you can either continue with where you are or you can look to other areas of employment or you can you know look to other areas within the same business but at least you've got the option and you've got the the, the evidence to back that up brilliant good answer um so how do you learn some of the things that you're not good at you talked about some of the things that you don't like um mm -hmm. I suppose this is a little bit about motivation as well how do you learn them? Um, for me, it's about okay. Like I say, I don't, I don't really like data. I, I don't. However, I've got a really great um, performance marketing manager who actually loves data, and he makes sense of it for me. So he he puts it into a language that is appropriate for me. So we've worked together quite a long time. So he makes it interesting. So all of a sudden, I want to learn about it. I want to understand how that should influence my decision making. So it's finding tricks and tips that help you to, to find that way through the dislike. Now, that could be a TED talk. It could be your CIM training. It could be just speaking to a mentor. It could be just reaching out to a colleague and seeing how they repackage those things. There are various ways that you can do that. But look, we've got to be, you, you've got to be realistic. There are going to be things in your career, in your daily life that you don't like. And you know what? You're human and that's fine. Just so long as you recognise that sometimes you just have to put your big girl knickers on and suck it up really and just get on with it. If you find it's a weakness and that it's a it's going to damage your output, then that's where proper, proper training comes in. And I think that that's the difference of whether it's just a dislike or whether it's something that is actually lacking. And I think only you as an individual would know that. Sure. OK, thank you. So we hear a lot of it about digital skills and how important they are. Um, and is that important when you're if your strengths lie in writing, for example? Um, we see a lot of jobs these days where you're expected to have skills in both areas. Mm -hmm. Can you is there is there, is there examples in, either in your in your career or within your team where you've got people who are flexible or perhaps have multi skills? Yes, absolutely. Um, so in my in my team, I've got some. Well, what have I got? I'd probably say I do err on the side of more generalists because with a, a passion or a, a, a lead in one area, because that allows me to get a bit of free training for the team as well. So if you've got a content writer that can actually do film editing or podcasts, they can actually train other areas of the team to do some of that as well. So that's, that's called de-risking your team because if someone's on holiday or they're absent through illness or they leave or something like that, all of that IP hasn't left with them. So for me, um, yes, I think there, there are areas where there is some very, very specific roles that need to be filled that can't be done by a generalist. Um, but in the main, I tend to go with people that have got a passion for one aspect, but can do bits of others or at least are willing to learn bits of others as well. Thank you. So one thing to boost your employability what would that be now i'm saying that you're probably not trying to boost your employability but this goes back to um well we, yeah okay Let, let's talk about lifelong learning yes um, is, um is an example there? i have lifelong learning is, is crucial and um 
you know, I, I've mentioned TED Talks. I, I'm a big fan of those, right? Because I just think that you get you get some really great nuggets from that. Um, I do use your uh, CIM facilities quite often. Um, I do go to conferences and exhibitions where there are um, like-minded peers and more senior individuals than me so that I can get um, their experience. One thing I've really found important to me as I go up through my career it's not necessarily on the skills for marketing but it's the skills for being a leader is um, securing a couple of mentors because you get a really great insight into where your weaknesses are as as a leader so I think it's really important that you have uh, an ability to self-reflect and be self-aware but you can only do that within a certain uh, level you, you you know you've got a blocker on yourself you don't know whether you actually do that really well you might think you do and you might actually not so things like 360 degree appraisals those sorts of things are really important um, I, I have recently gone through a sort of a, a process of looking at uh, moving into a slightly different job um, as a client experience lead and I had to sort of justify my existence there and it's it really is about what makes me the individual I am and this is I'm talking generically not just me me um, and I think that that ability to be authentic and to be myself and to be given the opportunity to be authentic is really important to me and my career. And fortunately, I've always worked with organisations that have allowed me to do that. Um, so from that point of view, I think that that makes that's boosted my employability in a way that I. I I kind of haven't realised until I was a little bit later in my career. Okay, brilliant. Um, now we probably have one last, uh, sorry, time for one last question. And, and we talked at the top about the importance of well-being and, and happiness. So I think it's it's only it, it's only important to, to to deal with that now. Somebody's talking about stresses. Now I'm not suggesting that you get stressed in your job, but there are parts of stressful situations that we all feel. Um, in our job mm -hmm. what do you do to, to manage situations like that um okay so the first thing that you should know is that I've got three board collies so um if ever I get really really stressed I just take time out I I take them around well I say around the block I live on a farm so around the block for me is like a mile walk mm -hmm. so actually stomping through some country lanes just resetting really helps me because sometimes your 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 job is is ever present it's it's in your head constantly and you're thinking god i've got to get that right oh my god that spelling error oh my god oh my god oh my god and you start to distill it down and it becomes this thing that's like constantly on your shoulders like this devil but what i say to my team around that and and i try to do it myself is that look we're not saving babies okay and you know some people are saving babies and they have every every right to be stressed but if you're just putting out an invite for an event and there's a little bit of a type on it yeah okay doesn't look great but nobody's dying nobody's we're not saving babies we're just just reconfigure what does that mean in the grand scheme of things take a breath and put it right Everyone will forgive you for making an error. You're human. So just take a breath. And that's the sort of aspect of stress that we we find uncontrollable sometimes. We don't take enough time out to to just think, really, what, why does it matter? Because we get so involved in the process. Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute that you're unprofessional about it and you think, oh, it doesn't matter, you know be be aware of it correct it apologize if you need to but but don't don't let it eat you up and if you do start to get to that point where you feel like it is eating you up take time out just take a breath whatever works for you whether it's fitness whether it's going for a walk whether it's just you know going for a nap 
um, talking it through with someone. Just take time for you. Now, I'm I'm terrible at this. I don't take enough me time. I work too many hours and it's sort of like do as I say, not as I, you know, no, do as I say, not as I do. I'm, I'm absolutely shocking for it. But what I think is really important is, again, to celebrate those successes, because once you celebrate the successes, the little losses don't become that big and it just resets you. And quite frankly, yes, you will have stressful days. You really will. But working a career in marketing gives you so much happiness, so much joy that you won't get in a lot of careers. So, you know, we're the lucky ones, to be honest. Great answers there. Good advice as well. Uh, sadly, that is all we've got time for. And we said before we came on, on air that we would uh, probably run out of time because uh, there's lots to talk about. Um, and thanks for everybody for, for, for questions in there. Um, I just want to talk about um, the next Marketing Club webinar series, which is uh, called Make an Impact with a Standout Personal Brand. So we talked a little bit about personal brand today, so maybe that's something you want to check out. And that will be at 6.30 on Wednesday, the 20th of April. And that's with Deborah Ogden. And she will explore how... Managing your personal brand can help build confidence and improve Im impact and, and boost your career as well. So it's an extension of, of what we talked about today. And you can find further details of that on CIM website, uh, where you can also register for the session as well. So once again, um, I want to say thank you very much to everybody listening. Also, thanks, Deborah. That was amazing. Uh, loved having you on there. Um, sadly, there's a few more questions that we didn't get answered, but hopefully um, guys can check in uh, at some point in the future and uh, feel free to ask the questions again and um, um, it'd be great to get those answered. Um, we will be emailing you actually a short survey from, from today's webinar. So it'd be great to hear some feedback, whether you thought this was interesting, whether you didn't. Um, it only takes a couple of minutes and it's all anonymous if you, if you put in some responses in there. That helps us build up an understanding of what is interesting to you and, and we can build on that and, and put future events together and get certain speakers in there. Maybe you want to hear more from Deborah. I certainly do. Um, and we could we could potentially get her back on. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sure I could have that discussion. <laughs> um, so that leaves me once again, just say thanks, Deborah. Loved it. It's been amazing chatting to you. And thank you, everybody else, for, for joining. Um, in the meantime, take care, everybody, and have a good rest of your day.